Hello and welcome to episode 15 of Think Big with Michael Zellner, all positive, no politics. My guest today is Tom Gray. Tom is the managing editor of Ring Magazine, known as the Bible of Boxing. He has called world title bouts all over the place, and he has interviewed some of the best boxers in the world today. Uh, welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me. appreciate it. Ah, thank you. So tell us something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Wow, what an expansive question that is. Um, something that people don't know. Um, we're off to a good start. I can't think of anything massively interesting outside of the the job that I do, to be quite honest. Um, that, that's the only thing I think that would interest anyone else. But um, yeah, probably best coming back to me on, on the interesting bit, which makes me sound like the most boring human being in the world. <laughs> that's okay. Um, first of all, congratulations on a ring magazine, you know, two, 2022 is obviously the hundred year anniversary of the publication. And when it was first published in 1922, it was both a boxing magazine and wrestling magazine. And, um, yeah. it's currently owned by Oscar de la Hoya's golden boy enterprises division of golden boy promotions. Why do yeah. you feel the ring has been so successful as it surpasses a hundred years? Well, I think that, you know, the answer is essentially in the fact that it is 100 years old, the tradition attached to the championship, the great names and icons that have been attached to the, the magazine down the years. And the first ring magazine champion was Jack Dempsey. You're going back to a period in time where boxing could literally stop the world. So just focusing on the heavyweight division from Jack Dempsey through Joe Lewis, through Rocky Marciano, through... Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and so on, all the way up and through. So it's, it's basically the magazine has chronicled the majority of, of modern boxing history. And I think in that sense, it's, it's very, very unique. And some of the, the great artwork, not, you know, not to take anything away from, from the writing, without the writers, there's, there's nothing there. But the, even if you're not necessarily going to sit and read a, a magazine cover to cover like you and I will have done several times some of the the cover art is is iconic in itself and instantly recognizable and I think from a standpoint of the magazine I think it's pretty much unmatched in that in that area um, you talk about you know Jack Dempsey and he obviously was the the first uh, title bout uh, you know was awarded to him you know from ring magazine and he was you know reigning heavyweight champion for seven years from 1919 to 1926. Yep. He, he had tremendous punching power. He was a really aggressive fighter. And I think he's ranked 10th on ring magazines list of all time heavyweights. What do you think made him such a special fighter? Well, um, he, he basically transcended the sport during the, during the 1920s when he came on the scene, there had been nothing like him. It's sort of like fast forward, 60 years when Tyson came around, like people were awestruck by, by Tyson's presence in the ring. And when Dempsey came around, there hadn't really been a fighter, a heavyweight with that kind of ferocity, you know, willing to take on, you know, not all comers because there's some, uh, there's some, uh, there, there's a couple of fighters that were perhaps avoided just, you know, during the time black fighters were avoided during that time criminally. So um, I'm not sure, you know, if we'll never know if Dempsey was directly associated with that, but the, the men that he could fight, and there was some there was some top quality heavyweights that he went through during that time, were were still excellent. You know, he took out some some top fighters, and it was more method of victory. You know, he just tore into people's throats, um, and that was you know look at the gate that that he created. I think it was a hundred odd thousand fans. I always get this wrong. Was it Tunney or was it Carpentier? can't remember but basically his gates were phenomenal first million dollar gate was a Jack Dempsey fight and he was just a massive attraction and because of his his, his presence at that time um he became iconic someone that's unforgettable over 100 years later you know every year ring magazine has its uh fight of the year in the 70s the winners were pretty much dominated by Muhammad Ali Joe Frazier yeah. George Foreman uh, in the 80s, it was Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Mar Mar Marvin Hagler, and uh, Thomas Hitman Hearns. Um, yep. Besides boxing being 15 rounds back then compared to 12 now, what do you feel are the main differences in, in boxing today compared to back then? Well, I think, you know, I don't want to put us on a downer, but I, I think that um, it was easier to get the top elite level operators into the ring. There was far less politics involved, you know, um, there was still there was still competing 
promoters and rival TV networks. But if you take HBO um, in the 80s and right up into the thousands, I believe, certainly the early thousands, HBO would just turn around to the promoters that they dealt with and say, make the biggest fights possible and bring the fight to us. End of story. There right. wasn't any of this, you know, let's have, or you don't like this promoter or you don't go on with that promoter or this TV network doesn't want to work with this TV network. That was far less in evidence. And because of that, you know, well, I mean, fans did wait for like Leonard versus Hearns. Fans did wait for Leonard Hagler probably for different reasons. But fights were really scuppered because of who promoted a fighter or, you know, this, this constant bickering you see now on videography channels on social media, which I think has done a lot to damage the type of matchups that fans deserve. Um, so certainly the, the fights were easier to make, I think, back in that period because promoters were basically forced to make them easier. You know, there's a lot of fights that have been that have transcended boxing. Uh, one of them is uh, Duran Leonard in 1980, uh, you know, when Duran won in a 15 round decision. And the fight that's been ranked uh, number one by you guys that transcended boxing is Frazier Ali in 1971. It, it's been said that the, the two of those guys brought out both the best in each other and the worst in each other. Uh, what do you feel was so special about them and their fights? Well, looking at the looking at the style confrontation it was it was beautiful athletic you know boxer against you know a come forward slugger that would not take a backward step so just when you say that you know that those styles are going to gel in the ring they had three fights one and three considered classics number two actually very underrated you know i get the feeling that a lot of people look at the second fraser ali fight and just say it's not good because for the sake of it. But the bottom line is you need to sit and watch a bit closer. I mean, it's a non-title fight and it trumps most heavyweight championship fights that you'll have seen in the last 25 years. So, you know, in the ring, they were made for each other. It was a boxing rivalry made in heaven. Out of the ring, very different personas. Ali was um, had social, political significance and, and basically was, was on the front pages as much as he was on the back pages. Frazier was just a prize fighter, wanted to get into the ring, keep it simple. Um, Ali would have a, have a go at him, and, and Frazier couldn't match him um, verbally. And F Joe Frazier was not someone to, to trifle with or mock. So that basically created real enmity. I mean, a, a lot of times you see boxers clash, and you can actually tell sometimes when you get a bit long in the tooth like myself that it's contrived, that these guys probably get on pretty well, but for the sake of building up a promotion, they need to create this unrealistic um, kind of, of argumentative build-up, whereas with Frazier and Ali, it was, it was always real. Um, you know, we just recently passed the 20-year anniversary of the Lennox Lewis-Mike Tyson fight that actually was held here in Memphis, Tennessee at the Pyramid. Yeah in uh, June of 2002 and Lewis knocked out Tyson in the eighth round and ring called it the knockout of the year for 2002. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about earlier, Mike Tyson, his dominance. And, you know, I remember when he came on the scenes in the mid to late eighties, he just blew away everybody. I think fighters were actually scared to get in the ring with him. Many of the guys were and and then in 1990, arguably one of the most, the biggest upsets in boxing history when Buster Douglas knocked him out. Right. Um, what do you think, you know, after that Tyson pretty much went downhill. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Do you think he had success too young and too quickly and, and he just lost his edge and desire? Well, you know, I think you've, you've touched on it there. I mean, the, he was awesome, you know, world level, essentially. I know that I don't know when he exactly he broke into the top 10, but he was pro at 19 and a, and a killing machine at that point. Um, won the title, it might have been pro 18, won the title at 20, um, but he'd physically matured. Now, as a character, and he would admit himself that he wasn't mature as a man by that point, which created demons and, and, and difficult things that would catch up with him later in life. But a lot went wrong. Um, you know, I, I watched I watched those fights. I watched Spinks and Berbick and all of those when they happened. Me too. Um, if, not, if not at the time, then certainly on the next day. Um, he got away from the people that really got him to the point of, of glory. And, you know, Customato passed away. Right. Um, losing Kevin Rooney was, was a major league disappointment because Kevin Rooney would always insist he was in the best shape possible. I challenge anyone to find Tyson out of shape, 
you know, for a, for a Kevin for a fight where he had Kevin Green in the corner, it just didn't happen. So you get rid of him, and then he uh, and then he lost Jimmy Jacobs, and Jimmy Jacobs was close closer to him than than Caton, Bill Caton, and then he got under Don King's wing. So you know, when when you when you read that back, when you look at it in the final analysis, it kind of spelled doom. Then he didn't train well enough um for fights buster douglas a lot of people want to make out like oh you know buster douglas just had the tools no tyson was ill prepared he crashed right. the weight um he crashed the weight and it showed in his performance and and he got wasted by in my opinion an inferior fighter now people would argue that but i, I honestly believe that if mike tyson had had a rematch against buster douglas trained perfectly had kevin rooney back then he would make strawberry jam of buster douglas so yes he just went downhill rape conviction three years inside and, and that was that he ran into Vander Holyfield. So that was that, yep. um, you know, I mentioned Roberto Duran, you know, before some people don't know that he actually was in the movie Rocky too. Um, yep. you know, in well, he's a sparring partner, right? Exactly. He was a sparring partner when, uh, Rocky was training for Apollo Creed for that second fight. And yep. I remember, uh, the trainer, uh, Rocky's trainer, Mickey saying, if you can catch that little speed ball, you can catch Creed easy. I just remember yeah. that, that line. And, you know, speaking of Rocky about four years ago, you bought the ring magazine record book that was on the desk of miles Jurgens uh, in the, in the office, uh, in the movie. And you only paid $2 for it. And, <laughs> and, uh, but you, you've obviously done your homework because I think I only put that on Twitter at one, at one time, but yeah, I was, um, I was at the hall of fame. Yep. Yeah, and, uh, we had a, like a ring stall set up. And I, there was a guy putting out ring magazines and ring magazine record books and um, almanacs and, and that kind of thing. And this one just jumped out to me because it was my it was my date of birth as well, or my year of birth was 75. So it jumped out and then I said, wait a minute. And I, I'd watched Rocky recently and I can remember seeing like 19, what, the ring 75 on the spine. I went up and yeah, I got it. I've still got it. It's, it's not here just now. The wife has probably put it in a put it in a box somewhere but um i've definitely still still got it interesting read actually there's some information in there that you wouldn't get anywhere else you'd struggle to find online to be honest you know and that man that you bought it from i think he was like 75 and he had every issue dated back to like 1949 that's just unbelievable yeah yeah it was um, like i say i mean I, you, when you're at one of these things there was a lot of stuff getting sold and i i actually was walking away from things because if you give me enough time and i'll and I'll bleach my credit card. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I just, I wasn't in a position to get as much stuff back as I would probably have wanted, but I got that, which was a bonus. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, you know, Sugar Ray Robinson is arguably, you know, the best pound for pound fighter of all time. And growing up, you know, I heard, you know, the term referred to a lot with Roy Jones Jr. You know, he always, you know, especially he referred to himself as pound for pound. What does that term pound for pound really mean? Oh, what a question. It means different things for different for different people. I mean, I um to me, you're looking at, and I don't even know if I get it right myself, but when I'm when I'm putting forth my opinions on the pound for pound top 10, I do tend to go a lot towards resume because to me, you've got fighters like if you take a Canelo Alvarez, Canelo, you know, despite having these detractors, has got since Manny Pacquiao retired, I think he's got a case for having the best resume in world boxing. Um, whereas there's fighters on the pound for pound list that simply don't have that, that don't have the same quality of competition on the resume. I tend to go there first. Obviously, the you know the the tools in the toolbox. You know what can they do? What can't they do? The reason that Roy Jones. I believe would say that he was pound for pound number one is because he could do things that no other fighter could do. And I mean, all of them. Um, Roy was around at a time when Floyd Mayweather was around and Roy could do stuff that Floyd couldn't do. Um, Roy could do stuff at his best that Bernard Hopkins couldn't do. So there is a big element of eye test. You know, what does that fighter actually do for you when they're in the ring? You know, are you blown away? Does he take your breath away? Jones could certainly do that. Mayweather a bit different. Mayweather didn't have the same kind of... Uh, crazy kind of reflex based defense and, and like punches that didn't even exist. Floyd was very, very technical, very specific, had basically mastered the fundamentals of the sport um, defensively, but was also much better offensively than a lot of people are willing to admit. Granted, in higher weight classes, he was, um, you know, 
a bit more defensive, but it had to be because he was naturally smaller a lot of times. Um, but he was still out of this world. Pernell Whitaker is another example of a pound for pound great. Chavez, I could go on and on and on. But you know, technically, in, in, in my opinion, I think you should have you should have the resume to, to back yourself up. You should be able to say, look, I'm taking on the best fighters in the world. It doesn't even need to be in multiple divisions. That's another thing. Marvin Hagler was never anything other than a middleweight. Does right. that hurt his pound for pound standing? Hell no, because you know he decimated the middleweight division three times over. And I'm not going to come down on marvelous Marvin Hagler like that because he never moved up and fought Michael Spinks, and that's just crazy. But if you are able to fluctuate up and down the weights and not necessarily stay in one division and make multiple defenses, if you can go up successfully and 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 do things, that's equally as impressive. You know, so many athletes today go, you know, back when I was growing up in, you know, in the eighties, you know, when you said an athlete was, you know, 35 years old, you looked at, you know, in any sport almost today, you look at them as old. Yeah. It, it's changed now. You know, some of the, you know, baseball players, you know, Justin Verlander, who's pitching now is like 39 years old and having his, you know, one of his best years ever. And these yeah. athletes go into their forties now, and even boxers now, you know, when you said 40 back then, you're like, oh this person needs to retire, but yeah. it's different now. Do you think that a lot of it has to do with training and things that have been learned over the years? Yeah, that's it. I mean, you do have examples back years ago, like Archie, Archie Moore, I'm sure boxed professionally to, to was over 50 and was, was making world title defenses at light heavy in his forties. Hopkins, who I think has got a case to be one of the greatest athletes that's ever lived has what Hopkins did was anything bad that you can imagine, he never went anywhere near it. You know, he would send steaks back in restaurants if they'd added wine into the sauce, you know, and he'd basically picked up that kind of discipline and dedication for himself in, in prison. So there is an element of it where fighters now keep it a lot cleaner probably um, than, than they did. They've, you've got health and nutrition. You've got... Um, strength and conditioning coaches that will probably push you towards avoiding injury, whereas that wasn't really the case back then. Gloves have changed a lot since back in the day. Glove size, you know, has changed a lot. So fighters are taking, still taking punishment, right? But not right. maybe taking the level of punishment that they were because of smaller gloves. Um, the amount of rounds that fighters do has went down from 15 to 12, non-title 12 to 10. You know, so there's, there's a lot of things like that that have changed that, allow fighters to prolong their career but I think a lot of it comes down to not fighting as much as well if we're being honest certainly when you reach the the top level I mean these days to a year I mean I know Canelo I mean you know everyone was jumping jumping up and down because Canelo fought four times in a calendar month but fighters used to do six times eight times and you know I could I could go even further than that I mean I think Robinson fought 13 or 14 times in a month, in a, in a, wow. in a month was it? it was yeah, crazy. It was like every few days. Yeah. Um, so if, if you go back and look at his early career, so yeah, fighters are, are basically able to um, prolong their careers and, and, uh, and get away, you know, get the full benefit of their athletic primes and, and get out in good condition. So, you know, uh, Katie Taylor is the undisputed uh, lightweight champion in the world. And this past May, just a few months ago, Taylor and Amanda Serrano fought at Solot Madison Square Garden. You know, Taylor won the fight and the two of them combined through 999 punches. That's mm -hmm. just friggin' amazing. Um, their second fight has been called the biggest rematch in women's boxing history. What do you expect from the two of them in the second fight? Well, if it goes down again, I, I honestly thought Serrano... Um, had Katie on the hook in that fight. You know, she was badly, badly hurt from what I could see. Very vacant in the ring. Only her conditioning, I think, saved her. And then all the ring smarts that Katie's accrued over time, over the great fights that she's had during her rise to being pound for pound number one, um, benefited. And, and I, th I think she legitimately won the fight. I think Amanda Serrano, to an extent, threw it away. So second fight, I don't know if it can be quite as good because I think... Katie would avoid the kind of exchanges that led to her being hurt as early in that fight as she was. I mean, she's already proven that she can box off Amanda Serrano, and I think she'd have a good chance of doing that again and perhaps winning a more comfortable decision. Uh, you talked about uh, Canelo Alvarez. You know, he's the super middleweight champion. Uh, he's going to be fighting uh, Genity uh, Golovkin, I believe. Genity Golovkin, yep. Yeah, for the third time in September. Um, their first bout in two, 2017, it ended up in a controversial split decision draw. 
And then Canelo won the second fight by majority decision. Um, Golovkin is one of the you know best super middleweight fighters of all time. He's a future Hall of Famer. Um, how do you expect the, you know, who do you expect to win the third fight? And what do you expect from that fight? Well, for Golovkin would go down as, as one of the greatest middleweights, not super middleweights. He's never really been up, okay. in, this, he's never been up in this weight class before. But um, it's difficult. I mean, I, I think that, that it will be a competitive fight, but there's Canelo's got a few aces up his sleeve here. He has got, since the second fight, which was, sorry, remind me, was that 2018? I believe it was, yes. Yeah, 2018. So since that fight, Canelo's got four years better and Golovkin has got four years older. Canelo has naturally matured over that period of time. Um, he's been all the way up to light heavy, probably his optimum weight at 168, so they're fighting at his optimum weight. Golovkin can still make middleweight pretty comfortably, so he's got the size advantage. He's got youth on his side um, compared to Golovkin. I think Canelo turns 32 years old today. So Golovkin is, has just turned 40. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's things on Canelo's side this time that weren't there. I, I was at the first fight, and uh, I predicted, the even though, I think, let me get this right, I thought Canelo was going to win that fight, but I predicted a draw. And as it turned out, Golovkin should have won the fight, and it ended up a draw, made some money off that. Second fight is as good a middleweight championship fight as I've seen in years. And I thought Canelo got, you know, just a bit under decision. If you think that Golovkin won it, fine. Um, there's nothing to separate the two to that point. What separates them now, in my opinion, is like I say, Canelo's got four years better and Golovkin's aging a little bit, I think. And he's out with his, his natural weight class here. Uh, current ring in WBC uh, heavyweight champion Tyson Fury is supposedly retired in April after the six round knockout of Dillian White. Yeah. Um, Fury and fellow boxer Derek uh, Chisora used to be friends, but Fury said in the last few days, he said if he sees Chisora, he's going to punch him in the face. What's going on with the two of them? Um, something, there was a bet, I think, that Derek Chisora made um, with Tyson Fury. It was something along the lines of, you'll not knock him out, and if, if you do, then I'll buy you a house. So there was, there was some sort of bet, and I think right. Fury believes that... Um, Derek, Del Boy has welched. Do you I think? think that's do you think that Fury uh, is going to come out of retirement to fight the winner of the U6 Joshua match? Put it this way: um, I think if Joshua were to win that fight, <clears throat> excuse me, which I don't think he will, I, I'm favoring U6 to win. But um, if Joshua were to win, the amount of money that would get offered to Tyson to come out to face Anthony Joshua would be astronomical. It would be record-breaking money, I believe. Um, well, maybe not. You know, maybe they've made crazy money against Pacquiao, but it would be around there. You know, it would be crazy, crazy money. Certainly, I would expect the Far East to bid on it. So Tyson said 500 million, you know, half a billion quid. I don't know if he'll get that, but he might get something close to that because if Joshua, in my opinion, if he, if he were to beat Alexander Yusik, he is tagged at that point is a truly great heavyweight that this is what you need to do in your career you need to overcome adversity and avenge losses a lot of people are doubting Joshua's ability even though I'm picking Yusik I'm not writing Joshua off his class but if he were to win this especially in decisive fashion then he gets listed as a truly great fighter in this era a truly great heavyweight in this era so keeping a good heavyweight in this era I think he becomes a great one if he if he wins the fight. So for those guys to clash, two Brits, undisputed championship, never happened before. Um, it would be enormous, and I think that would get Tyson's juices flowing. I don't think Tyson fancies the Usyk fight. And when I say he doesn't fancy it, I don't mean technically or that he's afraid. Tyson Fury fears absolutely nothing. And if you've not clocked on to that by now, then I can't help you. Um, you know, he's scared, he's scared of absolutely nothing. I just don't know if Yusik gets his juices flowing. Um, I think he views it as a, as a type of fight, perhaps, that's, that's not going to be, you know, good to watch or the type of fight he just doesn't want to be in. I, I don't think he fears him. And I, by the same token, I'm not sure 100% if the fact that it's undisputed will get him up for it. The way Tyson looks at it is he's won every belt already. He's not held them all at once. Right. But I don't know if that's enough to convince him that he needs um, Usyk. He needs to fight Usyk. I'm, I'm not 100%. I'd love to see it, but I, I don't think that Ty Tyson is nowhere near 
is up for a Usyk fight as he would be for a Joshua fight if Joshua were to win. What are some of the up and coming fights that you know people might not know about that we should know about that are coming up soon? You tell me if they're if they've not if they've not been um, announced. I mean, we've heard we've heard some whispers, right? That um, over here anyway, that um, uh, Corner Ben could be fighting Chris Eubank Jr. Um, which a lot of people are not up for it, and I'm different. I I think that's a a wonderful event for boxing. I think it would put boxing in a serious upswing. Um, I think the rivalry is, well, it's, it's already there before they even get into the ring just because of what their fathers accomplished. I lived through those days. And it's the type of event that I think boxing really needs, and I think it would be spectacular. So that's one um, to look out for. We're still waiting on the never-ending story fight between um, Terence Crawford and, and Errol Spence. I mean, it was looking like that was going to get announced um, or we'd hear something, but still nothing to this point. So... You know, obviously want to see that. What else is there? I'm looking for... My favourite fight in world boxing is Naoya Inouye. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him again, whether that's against Paul Butler um, or whether he goes for... Um, in fact, he needs to fight Butler to go for Undisputed at 118 pounds. And then a lot of people want to see him move up perhaps to 122 and face Stephen Fulton. Um, yep, there's a lot of potential you know, potentially great fights out there for the remainder of, of 2022. And it's been, a, it's been a good year up until now. You know, last month was the Boxing Hall of Fame Weekend Induction Trilogy. Uh, I think it was 2020 through 2022 that was combined uh, yeah. the Hall of Fame inductees. And they include some of the all-time greats. You talked about Bernard Hopkins, Floyd Mayweather, Leila Ali, uh, Vladimir Klitschko, um, Andre Ward, Ward Jones yeah. Jr., Tony, Coda, promoter oh. Lou Bella. Yep. Uh, tell us about that uh, exciting weekend, about what happened. Well, I wish I could. I wish I was there. I mean, I'd, I'd always said that I wanted to get to Bernard Hopkins, um, Bernard Hopkins induction. Um, but the protocol changed on when um, fighters could enter. It used to be six years retired, and then I think they changed it to four. Then obviously his induction was cancelled, and I was in, I was in L.A., just before, um, and I couldn't do both. It was just impossible. So I would have loved to have been at it. I watched some of the stuff that was recorded from it, but it was just, you know, it was a an absolute gallery of of, of all time greats over the last several years. Um, you know, I love all those guys. I've watched the, the the fights those guys have had. I've watched countless times. Everyone on the stage, pretty much. Right. So you know, it was um, it was a, it would have been a fantastic weekend. I, I don't, like one of my colleagues that. Um, one of the editors at Ring Trist Dixon, he was he was over in um in Canastota for it. I, I was over for the class of 2017, I think, mm -hmm. 2018. Forgive me. Um, it was the one where Vitali, Eric Morales, Winky Wright um were, were inducted. And it's a brilliant experience. Any boxing fan that's not been, I would advise them to make a, a serious effort to go because it's fantastic. And you know, I'm glad they were back. I'm glad to get back because I, I know that um uh, Ed Brophy, et cetera, I've had a hard time, you know, having to can, you know, arranging everything and then having to cancel last minute. It's been very, very difficult. So it's um, a blessing that they're, they're back in the mix. It's a really good occasion for boxing. It's also one of the times where boxers, even if they're, they're no longer in the ring, get made to feel really, really special on that weekend. Who do you believe would have won a fight between Muhammad Ali, I know that these are probably weird questions that you've gotten over the years. No, you know, not, but, at all. not at all. Um, you know, who was Cassius Clay that, you know, when he knocked out Sonny Liston in the first round or the second fight mm. or Mike Tyson in, you know, at the beginning of his career and you know, when he knocked out Michael Spinks in the first round of theirs, who do you think yeah. between the two of them would have won a fight? I'm, I'm team Muhammad Ali on, on that one. I, interestingly enough, I don't know if I necessarily take the, the 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 version of you know Ali from from the Sonny Liston fight as beautiful as he was in that fight as great as quick as he was in his feet um, he's only a twenty two year old kid now Tyson you look at the younger Tyson because if if you're matching the younger Tyson you need to go for that one because he was like a firework. He just, you know, he just hit the sky and then boom. Whereas Ali had more of a prolonged prime. Um, Ali in 1974, even around Joe Frazier two time, George Foreman time, is a seasoned and 
complete warrior in the ring, like knows absolutely everything. His punch resistance was also phenomenal. And I believe that if you get Tyson through five to six rounds now, Michael Spinks was angel cake for him. I've spoken right. to Mike directly about that fight. And he knew that there was no challenge there. He, he was actually in a training camp or in a gym and he, he knew how bad Michael Spinks' knees were. If you remember back to that fight, Spinks has got kind of like knee braces on. Um, so he knew that that was angel cake for him. Tyson fought much tougher heavyweights than had much bigger challenges at heavyweight than Michael Spinks. But so, you know, because he blasts out Michael Spinks at, at that point doesn't mean to me that he knocks out everyone in that kind of fashion. I think if Ali gets Mike Tyson beyond five or six rounds and the onslaught starts to slow down, I think that Tyson could be in a, in a heap of trouble. With that said, you know, you could ask someone else that question that's Team Ali and they would, they would swear blind that Mike Tyson had absolutely no chance. Well, that's stupid. Because in my view, if Tyson gets you on the hook, you know, he, he could have the finishing ability to get anyone out of there. Um, I mean, we're not talking about the guy that got knocked out by Lennox Lewis. You know, the, the Mike Tyson against Michael Spinks, in my opinion, is a match or a, a test for any heavyweight that's ever lived from any era, Ali included. You know, so much of bo boxing from what I've watched over my lifetime. I remember the fights in the in the mid to late 80s with, you know, Hagler and and Hearns and Leonard, and so much of it is, it's, you know, showmanship, psychological, they psych, you know, trying to psych the other guy out. And right. Ali was a master at that, you know, yeah. back when he started his Cassius Clay and, you know, and those guys, I mean, Ali, I, I just think was so good at doing that, that, you know, even he could have psyched out Tyson. I mean, I think Tyson psyched out Spinks. I mean, Spinks yeah. looked scared. Yeah, well, to, to be honest though, right. I mean, and I know that this was past Tyson's prime, but I mean, I, I never, I never saw, and I've, I know Ali's career backwards. Um, I've got every single televised fight and I'm, God knows how many, how many times I've watched them, but I've never seen Ali psyched. I had someone tell me recently that he was, he was scared in the ring against George Foreman. Like you've, you've been watching too much when we were Kings, uh, Ali, Ali wasn't scared of nothing. Ali didn't right. go into that fight, believing that he was going to lose to George Foreman, not in a million, not in a million years, not in 2 million, but I've seen Mike Tyson intimidated and to, to my mind, Evander Holyfield was in Mike Tyson's head rent free from the moment that the first fight ended and had a large, that had a large part to play in the fact that Tyson capitulated in the rematch. So right. in terms of mental strength, I don't think there's any doubt that, that Ali is superior in that, in that category. In terms of engine, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think that there's any doubt. I mean, Tyson has since admitted that he had asthma and that his gas tank could start to cave in a little bit during, during longer fights. I mean, it, you know, had good fights against Razor Ruddock, good 12-round fight. Um, and people forget, I mean, even, even in a fight where he was out of shape against Buster Douglas, you know, he got Douglas off his feet in round eight and took a lot of punishment. So, but he does definitely slow down. He does slow down in fights. Like in, in any 12-round fights that I've seen him in, 10-rounders, and I've watched all of Tyson stuff, his engine can, can let him down. And I think if Ali gets past five, six rounds, given that Ali was never really stopped in a fight, you know, he was pulled out against right. Holmes. And if you'd allowed him, he would have went back out to, he went back out for round 11 for, La, for Larry Holmes. He'd have fought to, to died, basically, Ali would. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think that Ali gets past. If, if, if you look at it, right, if Bone Crusher Smith can go 12, if Tony Tucker can go 12, Razor Ruddock can go 12, if all the, you know, and, and there's, there's another, other guy, I think that's maybe the three, 12 rounders in his, in his career. If those guys go 12 rounds, then I believe that Muhammad Ali can. I also believe that prime Larry Holmes would have given him serious trouble as well. And a lot of people might not know that, you know, Apollo Creed's character in the movie Rocky was based on a lot with Muhammad Ali and that hype and his talking and stuff, you know, that when Sylvester Stallone wrote that movie, you know, he had watched Ali and Chuck Wepner That's fight. Right. And then he went home and you know, wrote the movie and everything. But some people don't know that, you know, Apollo Creed was based on Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know that um, it was Ken Norton that actually was almost cast as Apollo Creed before Carol Weathers got the role. So, yep. yep. Some interesting history there. Definitely. What are some of the most important lessons that you've learned in your life? These questions are something else, man. Um, and I still need to get back to the first one that I missed. Um <laughs> I think, you know, there's a tendency, um, certainly me as myself as an individual, um, you can push yourself um, when you're doing something like my work takes up so much of my time and you can push yourself to the point where 
you uh, can start to get here, but you can you can push yourself too much. Um, and I think that having a, a good work life balance, I think, is very important, which is something that I'm trying to uh, trying to get right now. Like very very difficult to to do everything to get everything right to be good at my job and to be a good dad and to look after yourself health wise I and mean, I'm almost not far not far off of 50 so you, you need to you know a lot of things just trying to get things right you're there's a saying that you are what is it you're you're wise to too late in life and that's that's very that's very very true you make a lot of mistakes before you before you get there but yeah finding a good work life balance I think is is key because you can end up despite everything you achieve, you can end up not enjoying it if you don't have that. And um, I think if you're accomplishing good things in life, then you should, uh, you should enjoy them because you only go around once. Absolutely. How can uh, my audience find you on social media if they want to follow you? Best one is uh, Twitter and it's at Tom underscore gray underscore boxing. Um, I really, I know you're a really busy guy. I really appreciate your time uh, oh, today welcome. coming on today. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. I love talking boxing. It's one of my favorite sports, as you can see behind me of all time. Absolutely. And Rocky's yeah. your favorite movie, by the looks yeah, of it. Definitely. <laughs> yep. uh, definitely my favorite movie. So I appreciate your time and hope to have You're you welcome, back on Michael. again anytime, at some point in time. Anytime, man. Anytime at all. Thank you so much, Tom. You're welcome. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.